<clears throat> All persons having business before the Honorable Chief Judge and Associate Judges now presiding over the District Columbia Court of Appeals. Draw near and give your attention. God say the United States and this honorable court. This honorable court's now in the session. Please come to order. Good morning and uh, welcome to uh, the District of Columbia Court of Appeals for our virtual uh, remote oral arguments. Uh, this is a special sitting today. We're hearing one case. Um, Christy Carolyn Jones versus the United States. Um, and are the parties ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Um, yes, Your Ms. Honor. Wicks, um, may I, uh, I hope not to take, put you on the spot, but I just wanted to say it's good to see you. Um, I, I know that you had been away from the court and work for a bit and it's good to see you back. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor, very much. It's good to be back. Jennifer Wicks on behalf of Ms. Jones, um, appellant in this matter. Um, if I could start with, in, in preparing for my argument, I noticed in a footnote, my cite to the record was inaccurate. And it has to do with the testimony from trial counsel at the post-conviction hearing um, that it simply never, he didn't consider expert testimony. Um, and he also said, I believe I never considered um, expert testimony. And that was actually on January 5th of 2018, uh, starting at the bottom of 336, and then um, the answer ending on the top of page 337. So I, I just wanted to correct, correct that, because I think that's important, um, particularly when you look at the testimony of uh, Dr. Penrod in the post-conviction hearing, mm -hmm. his testimony about um, really that defense counsel's arguments and cross-examination would not give the jury the information they needed um, to consider the identifications and, and the reliability of those identifications. Um, so I, I remember Ms. that. Can I, can I just ask a procedural point? I'm sorry, Judge Steele. I just wanted to check to see if you wanted to reserve a couple of minutes for a rebuttal. Yes, I apologize, Your Honor. I would like to reserve two minutes. Okay, great. I'm sorry, Judge Steele. The way I read the transcript was, he said, sure, I didn't exactly think of calling an expert here. I didn't really consider it, but I didn't consider it because of a strategic reason, which is um, I wouldn't think to do that in a case where I already had the goods on the eyewitnesses. Well, I mean, what do you say to that? Well, I think if, if you look at the court's decision in RE-LC, um, it's not, I mean, yes, it's clearly, there were strong arguments to make. There was strong cross-examination to make, but the fact that there's something more you can do with that to help the jury assess that information, um, because it's, as the expert said here, it's simply not enough to help the jury understand it that you ask the questions and make the argument. They need the expertise, they need the advice to assist them in understanding the issues there. But at some point, you would agree with me that trial counsel can say enough is enough. Um, you don't always need to go, it doesn't need to be the best conceivable case to be effective counsel. Uh, you know, a second expert might have been helpful too, or maybe a third. I take it there's some point where you could say, I've got a good case and I'm gonna go forward with it rather than trying to drown it out with a hundred experts, right? There's, there's some breaking point that counsel's allowed to say, even though it could be marginally better, that's not enough to, to make me go down that road. Um, I agree. I think we're not here though, based on these facts and the issue here and the issue with this type of testimony is, and I think if you look at even trial counsel's arguments in um, Kazozi, uh, trial counsel really tried to say in his argument what he needed an expert to say, because he even said to the jury, you know, PCP, that makes you uh, say things that uh, you, you don't know, that you're not sure about. Um, and clearly, that would be 
there wasn't necessarily there wasn't a factual basis for that assertion in the record in that case. Um, so, so I think there's a point where trial counsel has to consider um, is there is is the is is the understanding of this issue be, beyond common sense and that's exactly what the expert saying here um that's exactly what the court said um in re lc um about the trial court's decision that it was common sense that bringing this out in cross examination and addressing an argument um would be sufficient um <laughs> Ms. Wicks, can I can I ask, you know, here, part of the trial judge's basis for finding that this was uh, strategic and also that there was, um, so there was no deficient, um, see, on the part of counsel, but also that essentially there was no prejudice because um, trial counsel had gotten information before the jury. Um, is there any uh, taking, putting aside the nature of the expert opinion testimony, um, is there anything that the trial counsel didn't say um, factually about the identifications that was critical and didn't come out? And then I also wanted to, uh, to say, to see what your thoughts were on the trial judge's assessment that part of what trial counsel did was to bring out things like high stress situation, um, uh, visibility, um, ID under pressure, all things that an expert would have said. At what points did trial counsel make those arguments, comments? How did it come out at trial? Um, um, well, I think one thing that was missing was the issue of transference. Um, because all these people lived in this, particularly because in these facts, all these mm -hmm. people lived in the same neighborhood. Um, and so it, and I think actually the fact of is she comes and she's, according to the officer, she's sitting across the street. According to Mr. Hartridge, she's two feet away when she comes to the scene and he identifies her. So um, it certainly could have been just transference from that situation or it could have been transference from the neighborhood on some other day. Um, that wasn't before the jury. And was that something that specifically came out in Penrod's testimony um, in the later hearing that he would have talked he, about? Yes, he did. Um, and it was in the record, um, pages 94 to 96 of his testimony. Um, he talked about, he also talked about the difference between facial recognition and body type recognition, um, where um, it's identifications based on body type um, are poor in terms of accuracy compared to facial recognition. Um, and that's the type of identification that was made in this case. Um, they were as, saying as, that- as, as to the complainant, right? What about, what about Mr. Hartridge? Mr. Hartridge did make a- facial that identification based on viewing or seeing her face, right? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Yes. Just want to make sure I understood the record correctly. On the transference point, I mean, was there evidence in the record or was there any indication that counsel had done any investigation that would support that argument? Um, no, I mean, I, he should have been aware of it by the time they were testifying in that it was in the record how long each of the, uh, the complainant and the, and the landlord had lived in the neighborhood. Um, and he, um, it was in the record of the post conviction hearing, how long she had lived in the neighborhood. Um, so yes, I, I don't think it was, um, it ended up being in the record of the trial. Um, but now that the record's more fulsome, I think we can look at that. Right. I mean, I guess my point is, I, I take it your argument is not just that the expert could have um, given the jury more information to consider in evaluating guilt, but also that the expert could have informed counsel's investigation 
of the case. I mean, presumably counsel could have gone out to try and develop a factual foundation for how and when the transference occurred. Absolutely. I wanted to ask a, 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 a bit about Ms. Wilkes, the investigator's report, um, because again, um, the trial judge uh, in her um, decision based on the 23110 hearing um, found that, you know, basically all the information in the report came out through um, Mr. Rushing's testimony and um, in other ways was before the uh, court at trial. Um, is there anything that didn't adequately get presented uh, during trial that was in Ms. Ms. Wilkes' report? Um, I think the, the issue that I raised was when trial counsel wasn't aware of everything that had actually occurred at that meeting because he didn't have the report, he didn't open on that. Um, mm -hmm. It seemed that he wasn't aware that Mr. Rushing had picked out somebody else. It didn't cross uh, him, right? Yeah, it didn't appear as though he was really aware of everything that occurred at that meeting it, until she's on the stand and then he's getting the report and all of that sort of fleshed out during trial, but he's not articulating all of that in his opening. Um, but in his um, uh, questioning of the investigator and in his closing argument, um, does he then cover, I know they're scrambling during the trial to figure out does the written report exist? He ultimately gets it. Um, uh, so the lateness of receiving um, the investigator's report is, that's not the crux of your concern here, is it? What, what, no, what and, was and the prejudice that you want to highlight about this? I, th I think the prejudice was he had not re reviewed it prior to, he had not reviewed it in his preparation for trial. Um, and in his preparation- And, and had he reviewed opening. it, what else would he have done or should he have done in your view? I mean, because we do, there's a lot of times during trial where there's late uh, developing or late uh, um, d discovered information or evidence. Um, and so, you know, you take a short recess, you review it, you can sometimes cure the lateness issue and move forward without significant prejudice. So I'm trying to, to, to get at what he didn't do once you look at the trial in its entirety as a result and, of that. And I think the problem is it's not, this isn't a case where the government's disclosing something late. He had it, the, the record was she had emailed it to him. She had it on her computer. Um, he just had apparently prepared his witness to testify without reviewing the Jenks for his own witness. Um, and clearly it's something that he should have been aware of, reviewed and disclosed to the government at the appropriate time, which he didn't do. And so I just wanted to focus in on, on hearing from you ultimately the prejudice there. I think ultimately the prejudice is, um, it could have been a situation where the government asked for her testimony to be struck since they hadn't gotten her janks. Um, he didn't have it and didn't, I don't think, I think ultimately he didn't fully prepare for his opening argument. Um, in the end, because it was discovered while she was on the stand um, and she testified clearly about what occurred on that day, um, there wasn't a significant prejudice in terms of um, ultimately the, the record reflected what occurred and that came out, but he, he had not because he wasn't fully aware of that, he hadn't cross-examined, I think, Russian completely about that procedure and that interaction. So counsel, is, is it not part of your claim then that there was a, a failure to adequately supervise? I mean, because it seems to me that part of the issue with the investigator um, report is that it, uh, or actually the interview, um, is that it wasn't conducted properly and it left um, the investigator open to some pretty damaging 
cross-examination. You know, it makes me think in, in, you can have a theory of defense, but then if you put on a, a document that's say forged in support of your theory of defense, that's going to hurt you more than it helps you. And it seems like this might have been that sort of situation, but I'm not hearing you say that that's your argument now. Um, no, I am saying, I mean, I think he should have prepared her for the interview of the complainant and hopefully advised her also to att at least attempt to interview the landlord um, and advised her how to conduct that interview um, and the procedures to take if she's, it wasn't even clear that who made the decision to show the complainant the photo array again, I think there's, there's clearly, that's a delicate issue. There's clearly a discussion that should be between the investigator and the attorney before that's attempted, how you do it, what procedures you follow. And there was none of that. And she was that didn't explored, even, I'm sorry, was that explored at the 23110 hearing? Yeah. And, and she, and counsel, she counsel conceded that he didn't, talk to her about that? Yeah, I mean, it did. Yes, I think it was clear from the hearing, there was really no supervision about what she was doing. Um, and um, she didn't receive any instruction from him on how to conduct the photo array. Um, it was it was troubling. Um, and that clearly came out in the cross examination at trial. I mean, it looks I think it looked sloppy. I imagine it looked sloppy to the jury. I think it does prejudice Miss Jones because her def her the one witness they call at trial um, really looks sloppy compared to the presentation of the government's witnesses, um, and it it just looks uh, it ends up. I think it does hurt the defense. It hurts Miss Jones to call a witness. Um, to not have it be prepared. Um, and the, the attorney quite clearly on the record in front of the jury, um, not knowing about a report that the person wrote. Um, so, I, you know, I think it, it ultimately in front of the jury looks bad. Um, and, uh, you know, that sort of uh, comparison to how the government's case looked, um, I think ends up prejudicing Ms. Jones as well. All right, thank you, Ms. Wicks. Unless there are any other questions, I'll let you uh, reserve your uh, two minutes for a rebuttal, but we'll hear from um, government counsel at this time. Thank you. Good morning, your honors. May it please the court, Sharon Sprague on behalf of the United States. Um, I'd like to stick with what we were just talking about and correct a couple things or let you know how I read the record but then primarily talk about the expert witness issue, if, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. the, um, with respect to the supervision of the investigator, the testimony that came out um, ultimately, there was a lot of back and forth during the hearing, but the testimony that came out ultimately was that um, Mr. Mahasa, the defense counsel, had all of the information that was contained in that memo, except for one piece of information. And that piece of information was the fact that she uh, that that the witness pointed to number nine and said the assailant had hair like that. So the question came down to exactly when did the um, when did the uh, counsel get this memo? And it became clear that it was many months before trial that he actually received the memo. But he said he wasn't aware he hadn't read it and he did, wasn't aware of the the court found that he was not aware of the only the pointing to number nine and saying the hair was like that. Everything else, the court concluded, um, counsel knew from the beginning because of having conversations with the investigator. And all of those things were used in um, cross-examining the complainant um, uh, and, uh, or excuse me, yes, the complainant. Um, and then brought out, once, once the memo was absolute, that last bit of the memo was clear, and the memo itself was clear, it was all used in cross-examination, or excuse me, direct examination of the investigator. Counsel, um, are, are you arguing there's no prejudice? Or are you saying a failure to review your own investigator's reports is not deficient performance? Given the testimony from the 23110 hearing, Your Honor, I think, um, I think there's a, a good case to be made that there was no deficiency. 
Mr. Mahasa. Can we just pause right there? Mm -hmm. So the government is arguing that in an eyewitness ID case where there are two eyewitnesses and the investigator goes and interviews one of them, the failure to review a report or to be aware of a report until the day of trial is not deficient performance? In this particular case, do you, do you, I, I'm sorry, do you have a case to support that? Well, the, I mean, the case is the basic case law that there's not one way that, that um, an investigation and presentation of a case has to be presented. I this agree. Isn't an, I'm not talking about investigation and presentation. I'm talking about a lawyer's duty to be aware of the information that an investigator has compiled. So when an investigator gives a lawyer a report, don't you think that basic Sixth Amendment principles require the lawyer to actually read and process the report in a timely fashion? Yes, Your Honor, I do. However, in this case, um, Mr. Mahasa made it clear that all of that that he, all of the information was communicated by means other than the memo. Well, that goes to prejudice, I think. I'm just asking about the actual failure to read a report that is given to you by an investigator. You might say every single shred of information in that report was known to me by other means, but I still think that you could say that you're supposed to read your investigator's reports, particularly where the report is from an interview of a witness in a, of one of two eyewitnesses in an eyewitness ID case where there's no other evidence linking your client to the crime other than eyewitness identification. I understand that, Your Honor, and it's clear that it, it goes to no prejudice here. So, I mean, okay. that, that's, I, an that's easy, all I wanted to clarify okay. was whether that's, a, the well, that's an easy way to really it. arguing that this was not deficient performance or whether this was a prejudice argument. Well, I do. I don't think in a case in which, um, just to tie it up, in a case that where the d defense counsel was aware of all the information that this court would wanna say, it's deficient not to look at a memo that contained all the same information when that wouldn't meet the Strickland standard of, um, of not acting, not a, a performance that's so poor it's not acting um, like the counsel guaranteed by Sixth Amendment. So I do think I wanna, I wanna push back a little bit on- you know, I'm just, I, you, wanna, you wanna push back on that. I'm trying to figure out why. Why, why would we want to say that's not deficient performance? We might say it's not prejudicial in this case, but why would we want to say it's okay for lawyers not to read the reports of their investigators? Because this court doesn't micromanage exactly what defense counsel can and can't do in order to present their case. The, case, the court analyzes whether there was um, a deficiency under the Strickland standard. And, and that's the standard we have to measure this against. And here, where, um, and, not, and not only that, in this case, we had a, um, a, a investigator who was extremely experienced, more than 500 cases. There was a lot of testimony about how good all, she was. All, all the more reason to read a report, counsel. I mean, she's very well, I do think, I mean, you to know what she had to say. I understand that, I, I agree with the court that she should, he should have read the report. Um, his testimony made it unclear whether he actually might have read it when it first came in and then forgotten about it. It was very, that part was very unclear. Um, uh, but I think it is important to recognize that he did have all the information in there other than pointing to, to number nine's hair. Um, Wasn't that pretty important though? Um, yeah. the, the fact that he, you know, here we have a situation where the victim um, has been unable to identify um, the perpetrator. Um, and has, has, has misidentified, and not just unidentified, but misidentified. And, um, you know, the, the piece about that uh, he said one of the victim uh, photo array, people depicted in the photo array had hair similar to how he recalled um, the perpetrator. That, that seems to be pretty helpful to at least help to- um, um, It was, it was help helpful. To, uh, uh, um, bolster somewhat the the fact that the complaining witness had not been able to identify the perpetrator. It was help, helpful, Your Honor, and it was information that was also, except for the, the specific fact that it was number nine he pointed to, 
that mm -hmm. the red hair was in the police reports. The, the, he did cross um, the, before, before this colloquy with the court that uncovered the, when he saw the um, uh, actual memo, he did cross the complainant um, on red hair. That's exactly that information was part of the cross-examination. And so as Judge Pasichow recognized when reviewing this on the 23-110, the question was, okay, yes, maybe he should have seen it or should have focused on all aspects of the memo earlier. But the question was, what did counsel do, with, do to get that information before the jury once he saw the memo? And what he did was he admitted that all of that information through Investigator Wilkes th that day, the very next day. Oh. So ultimately, I think it, it does come down to there being no prejudice um, as a result of his uh, su s alleged super failure to supervise his investigator. Um, turning, if it's, turning to the issue of the expert witness, the, I, I'd like to suggest that um, appellant may have um, uh, framed the issue a bit too narrowly. The issue is, is is not simply should he should he call, have called an expert or should he not have called an ex expert? The issue. Ms. Is, Ms. Bragg, I'm, I'm sorry to, to jump in on this point, right? Uh, but this is one that's of critical importance, um, I think, to all of us as, as well as the investigators issue. But can you start just with the, the legal framework here? I mean, we have um, our decision in Ben in before this court, which which clearly says that um, it, it's it's not necessarily harmless error. It, it, is, it is significant when um, counsel fails to call an investigator. And particularly in this case where the, the case really boils down to an eyewitness case. That's all the evidence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would, I would argue, and I'd love to hear the government's perspective, that the, the evidence is not as strong. This is not the strongest eyewitness identification case we've seen. Mm -hmm. We have a complaining witness who really didn't was unable to because he was injured. So it was no fault there that he was not able to make a strong identification. But then, you know, the witness who was key here, the landlord, Mr. Hartridge, um, his identification is not so strong necessarily. It's not clear whether he had his glasses on, it was dark. He thought he had a weapon pointed at him. Um, so I, I guess I'd like to hear sort of what you think the legal standard was here first and then why these facts made this um, uh, um, harmless error here. Yes, Your Honor. I think, I mean, well, of course, just to, as a backdrop, ben, ben, of course, was a situation where the trial court had excluded proffered evidence. And that's very, that's different than, than here. Um, there was discussion about the value of eyewitness identification experts, which, you know, I understand and accept. Um, but here, I, that's why I was trying to talk about the focus of the legal inquiry. Mm -hmm. The question really is whether the defense counsel was deficient in the manner in which he chose to present his misidentification defense, in the manner in which he chose to present his defense, which was the wrong person was arrested. Was he so deficient that he was not reasonably effective um, under the Sixth Amendment? And whether to well, call how can we say that he... One, how can we say that he wasn't when he says that he didn't even consider calling an expert? Well, the court could- I mean, I thought we said in Kagozi that you can't really make an educated decision, a, a strategic decision, if you don't even know what your alternatives are or what the expert might say. Well, the testimony as it came out in the 23110 is that he did understand what he, he used the perhaps inartful term, I didn't even consider it. But as Judge Pasichow concluded, what he was saying was, I didn't consider it because as I was putting together my whole misidentification case, I thought it was unnecessary and I had a different approach to take. The court and why does that make any sense? Because I'll, it I'll seems like what, what he was saying is, I thought my case was strong enough, I didn't need it. And it seems to me there are two problems with that. Um, and one is that, you know, to the extent that he's relying on cross-examination, questions on cross aren't facts, aren't evidence. And the jury doesn't know everything that counsel knows or everything that, you know, the judges on this court is aware of from having reviewed prior eyewitness ID cases. So they, they have no framework for evaluating the information that he might be trying to elicit on cross, right? They don't know how to 
how to analyze that information. Um, and, and then to say that I'm just gonna forgo this because you know, it would only make my case stronger, I, I, that just I, seems I, illogical to me Well, and unreasonable. I can understand through that lens why it would seem illogical. However, that's not consistent with Mr. Mahasa's testimony and or with the trial court's findings. The trial court found that it was decidedly strategic choice of his to present a misidentification defense without an expert. And why and how did he do that? Because he was focused very strongly on two things. One, the absence of physical evidence tying the defendant to the crime. There was no blood on the defendant, even though it was an incredibly bloody scene. Um, and he focused on that. There was also no fingerprints, no DNA. Second thing he focused on was the conflicting and inaccurate and weak descriptions, as Your Honor pointed out, um, and non-identifications that were but, made but these, by Mr. Hartford. These, aren't, Mr. Rushing. these aren't mutually exclusive things. Uh, they're complementary. Um, to say I'm gonna focus on the bad IDs, uh, and I think I, I've got a good enough case without an expert, how is that a strategic choice when you could have made your case stronger? It's like, it's like if a football coach said, I'm going to play my second stringers because I think they can beat these guys. I only play my, my best football players when we're really going to get beat. Um, and then they lose the game. You would say, why didn't you play your best players? Why didn't you put on your best case? And I don't get why we can say it's strategic because he thought he could win with a worse case. And he was wrong about that. Um, so a just conceptual point, how is that a strategy? Because the strategy, the question is, what, what, what evidence was he, how was he going to marshal and present the evidence to make a, the, the argument that they arrested the wrong person? Remember, one thing very important to remember is that going into this trial, the only identification, the only identification that had been made was Mr. Hartridge's second sighting at the scene 30 minutes after. The, 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 and Mr. I, Mr. And I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I just ask, what was the downside of calling an expert? And does he ever identify one? Does the trial court ever identify one? Um, if there's no downside, I have a hard time seeing it as a strategic decision. Well, personally, I, I mean, having read the closing arguments, I, I, it wasn't discussed. I mean, to, I want to be clear what the record, he did not identify. Um, a downside, his focus was, I didn't think it was necessary. I thought it was a slam dunk um, uh, case without it, basically. He didn't use the word slam dunk. But, but that but goes I, back to my point about he thought it was unnecessary and why? Because he thought he could rely on cross-examination no. and that just, that just seems incorrect, right? It might As a matter, be. I mean, I, I get your point that he's focused on the, the lack of blood but he is making a mis ID argument, right? As, as you said, there's only one ID, it's a second sighting, you know, by a weak witness. So he has a misidentification argument. And to the extent that he is trying to rely on cross examination of that witness and thinks that probing a mis ID through the cross examination of a witness is going to be effective, he's wrong. Right, because one, the witness is not going to give out the information and say, "Oh, right, you know, I I recognize I had weapon focus." But even if the witness says, "Yes, I was focused on on what I perceived to be the weapon," and yes, maybe I you know misassessed the time, and I think that I saw it for longer than I actually did, the jury doesn't know what context to put that in, and that's what the expert does. The expert says, look, there are these all, all these observed phenomena about eyewitnesses that make their identifications potentially unreliable in these sorts of circumstances, right? And then the jury can put that information together with the eyewitnesses testimony and say, ah, now we, now we know how to process this information. But without the expert testimony, they don't have that ability. Well, it's important as this court instructed in Cozio to be assessing this from the, from the standpoint of when the defense counsel was making these decisions pre-trial. And as I was saying, there was only that one, there was the, the second sighting by Hartridge. There was rushing failing to pick um, the defendant out of a lineup twice. There were both, both key witnesses gave varying and off descriptions of the assailant. And it was against that backdrop that the counsel decided 
that an expert was strategically unnecessary. He had but, enough. To but show again, that. that gets me back to my point of he made that decision without talking to an expert. Whereas if he had gone to an expert and said, hey, look, these are my facts. What do you think? An expert would have said pretty much what Professor Penrod said at the 23110 hearing, which is, this is a really strong Miss ID case. And let me tell you all of the things that I could tell a jury about why they should be, you know, why there is reason to be concerned when these factors are present, right? And then, I mean, maybe after hearing all of that, he could make an informed strategic decision about whether or not to put on an expert witness, but without even consulting with the expert and hearing everything that the expert could say, I just don't see how he could make a strategic decision that, well, that we could rely on. Uh, there are two, two points I'd like to make in response to that, Your Honor. One is as the court, the court found that to go back to our football analogy, that um, the, the council basically had a game plan. He had a game plan and he executed it well. That in hindsight, there may have been additional evidence he could have presented does not make him deficient under, under Sixth Amendment jur jurisprudence. That in hindsight, the government's ID evidence got even stronger than anyone anticipated because of the surprise in court IDs um, of, by the two witnesses is also not relevant. How surprising were those? Pardon I mean, me? you, you had said in your brief that, you know, defense counsel couldn't have anticipated that, uh, which was a surprising statement to me. You would think defense counsel would at least want to be ready for the possibility that the government might elicit in court IDs. So, so why the, do you think- The government didn't elicit it. The Dutch government didn't elicit it. With each witness, the government said, so can you please tell me what was the description you first gave to the police? And each witness basically said some version of it look it's her, it's her. And in fact, there was a bench conference with defense counsel trying to exclude that and a lot of discussion about whether that was in fact an in-court ID, followed oh, I, by a lot of cross-examination about it. I take your point, and I, I suppose I don't want to drag it out too much, but I, I guess mine is whether or not it was elicited, wouldn't defense counsel want to be prepared for the possibility of in-court IDs? Like, it doesn't strike me as such a surprising development that the two eyewitnesses might be asked or might offer an in-court ID that you would want to be prepared to rebut. And, and, and that's correct. Um, but I'm just saying that we have to assess it at the point that the council was going into trial and deciding, how am I going to put my um, you've arrest, arrested the wrong person defense together? The other, the other critical point here that I think, uh, last critical point I'd like to make is that this is a very different situation than was presented to the court in Kagozi or Young. In both Kagozi and Young, an expert was absolutely necessary to provide the factual foundation for the arguments that this court concluded should have been made but were not. In Kagozi, that was the effect of PCP intoxication on the dying declarant, the only person who uh, you know, and whether to how to assess the reliability of those words. And but young, but it was Kagozi, a Kago, Kagozi, the defense counsel made the same argument he makes here. I, I you know, jurors get that somebody high on but PCP is going to have some perception and abilities. But there's a critical difference. In Kagozi, defense counsel could not make the argument that that um, that here's what PCP does to you. PCP um, makes it makes your perceptions unreliable. Um, and therefore, you cannot trust it. And here, here, all of the ground, all of the factual foundation was there. It's better, in a sense, than having an expert say it could happen. The most that Penrod could say would be um, in certain situations, many of which, on cross examination, the government would show didn't apply here. But in certain controlled situations, we have seen that 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 um, these factors make can can make um, an identification unreliable. Here, we had, he had something better than that. He had specific testimony that he elicited from Hartridge saying, I only had spot saw the face. Well, well but Ms. Ms. Bragg, you know, Ms. Wicks uh, made the argument that one of the key things that the expert uh, Penrod could have talked about um, was this whole notion of transference. And, and I don't know that that's something that's uh, within the ken of the average juror, um, the, the, the notion of uh, in a situation like this where everyone lives in the neighborhood, um, he, he has only a brief opportunity to uh, 
identify the woman coming out of the house under extreme duress. And then he looks up and sees somebody that he thinks looks like her standing in the crowd. Um, you know, that, that seems to me to be a, a pretty persuasive argument that the expert uh, here was uniquely positioned to address that wasn't raised um, on cross or in opening or closing arguments. I agree it wasn't raised, the, um, but it, there was testimony that Mr. Mahasa knew from his client. His client told him that um, she recognized him from the neighborhood. Um, she knew him by face. She, he was somebody who drinks with, with, with folks. So I think, and that my, he testified that he kind of wanted to stay away from, uh, you got the sense, I shouldn't say he testified that he wanted to stay away from whether they knew each other or not. But it's true that transference is the one factor, the one and only factor I would say that Dr. Penrod identified that wasn't brought out in cross and so on. But the key thing is that the- You were, you were gonna and, talk about Young real quick. You, you talked sure. about why- I mean, in, in Young- your, Why is Young different here? Well, in Young, the question was a mismatch between the price that was overheard by the police officers. They heard a conversation of $50, exchange of $50 for um, a potential drug sale. And then the value of the drugs ultimately recovered that were attributed to the defendant, which was valued at $200. There was, no, there was no way without an expert to say, these drugs were worth $200. Um, there was no way to make the appointment that there was a mismatch between uh, the price overheard and the value of the drugs received. And, include, and the defense counsel in that case conceded that he should have had an expert. These, the arguments there simply could not have been made without the expert testimony to provide a foundation. Whereas here, no omission um, no, there, there, he wasn't precluded. He had ample predicate to say the wrong person was arrested. And the last key point I'd like to make, if I may, and get your indulgence, is that um, the linchpin of this defense was there was no blood, there was no fingerprints, there was no physical evidence tying her. That is something that Dr. Penrod and, and an expert, test, expert could not have touched. The legal question is not really whether the expert might have added some weight to some of the arguments that the counsel could make. It's whether it was such a serious error that the defense counsel was not functioning as a counsel guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment. And I think that there were, when you saw the, the, the <coughs> government's rebuttal closing, you can see ways in which to answer Judge Deal's question from quite a bit ago. <laughs> um, you can see ways in which it, there is a downside. There was a potential downside. The government used all of those factors to say, um, well, of course his descriptions were gonna be different. He only had a couple seconds to view. So I think there is an argument to be made that the, that the expert testimony could have, been, could have undermined. Um, without an expert, counsel was able to treat those misidentifications as, as real, as solid in a way, and say, look, he identified the wrong person. You had someone say it was a five foot, the assailant was five foot tall, 140 pounds with red hair. My, witness, my client is 5'10", um, uh, heavy set, and has dark braided hair. You know, clearly he was describing someone else. If he had had an expert witness there to say, um, you know, th th there's the reason why people might, might not get the description or the it, it completely right is because of all these factors, the government could have used that the way the government did just as a matter of logic in the rebuttal. So I think there was a potential downside, but I, I, I didn't rely on that in my brief primarily because that wasn't what the court relied on. Um, the court and counsel relied on the fact that it was strategically unnecessary. That was counsel's testimony and it was the trial court's finding. And um, I just don't think enough has been pointed to to, to to suggest that that finding was without support. And for that reason, I urge the court to um, affirm the denial of the 23110. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Sprague. Um, Ms. Wicks, you, you have reserved a couple minutes for rebuttal. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think- Ms. Wicks, what do you think about the government's argument that, um, that the expert really would have hurt um, the defense in, in arguing that the government had failed to carry its burden of proof? No, I, I mean, I think the whole, the whole point of the expert is for the jurors to understand um, the complicated science behind witness identification. 
And that's, you know, if defense counsel had read Henry LC, I'm not saying he admitted that he hadn't read it, but I think any defense counsel reading Henry LC is thinking, wow, this is a judge who's been a defense lawyer, who's aware of the science and the trial court was saying it was common sense, but clearly the court of appeals is saying, well, it's not common sense. It's absolutely something that um, should be in front in on with the right factual predicate should be in front of the jury or in front of the trier of fact to help them determine the truth, you know, to understand about the identification. So, you know, there's, there's nothing, no one is saying in um, that, I mean, the whole point of the expert and the point of the science is the unreliability of this evidence. And to say that somehow it's going to help the government, there, there's clearly other, there's discrepancies between the two of them. There's even discrepancies about, you know, the landlord sees this woman coming out of the building and then uh, running behind the building. Um, there's a time in between um, there's certainly an argument of, is that a different person? Is that person that he says he sees, is that different than the person that had been in the apartment with Mr. Rushing? And then of course, it's for the jury to decide, is that, are, the, are those the same person? Are, is that the person that ends up on the street that afternoon? Is that Miss Jones? Either of those people. And the expert can help unpack all of that for the jury and give the actual factual basis for the arguments that defense counsel would make in closing um, and for what the evidence would be that, that defense counsel can open up on. The evidence would be that it could have been transference from another situation. It could have been transference from seeing Ms. Jones afterwards. Um, but to be clear, counsel, there's no third party perpetrator defense in this case. It wasn't that counsel was trying to say that one of the varying descriptions of the perpetrator was the actual description of the perpetrator, right? This was a misidentification Correct. case. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think was just trying to argue that nobody could consistently or reliably identify who the perpetrator was. And it sounds like the expert would have supported that defense. Yes. Um, although I, I do think the defense counsel was clearly not aware. Um, I mean, there's the, the evidence that Mr. Rushing was still injured and that, that, you know, clearly the government saying that's why he couldn't identify because of his injury. That's why he couldn't identify anyone in the photo array that day, although the detective never followed up with him. And then interestingly enough, we, we know, well, the defense followed up with him and showed him the same array and he's no longer injured. There was no suggestion that he was still injured when defense counsel interviewed him and showed him the photo array. And on that day, he identifies number nine. Who's number nine? I think the jury would like to know who's number nine. Um, how tall is that person? How much does that person weigh? We just have the picture of the face. Um, so, you know, that's the, he's saying that the hair but he's identifying number nine in the photo array that includes uh, Miss Jones. So I think it's, it's even stronger, but he didn't open up on that because he wasn't aware of that. Um, and that's another thing that the expert um, can help the jury understand the significance of that. Um, because it's, you know, I think sitting in the position of the fact finder, the fact that he identifies someone else in that photo array when he's not injured is very significant. And, and the fact that he doesn't open on that because he's not aware of it is concerning to say the least. Ms. Wicks, um, I think we, we take your argument and uh, we appreciate uh, the briefs and arguments of both parties today, uh, unless there are any final questions uh, from my colleagues, um, we are prepared to take the matter under advisement. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you both and continue to stay safe and well. Thank you. Thank you. You too. You too. Okay. I think we are ready to uh, hear the second case, uh, Lyles versus United States.
Mr. Engel, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, and if it pleases the court and it pleases the uh, counsel for the government, my name is Tom Engel and I represent the appellant in this case. The government concedes in its brief that Odom gave opinion, testimony, and that it was significant to the government's case. And I'm going to briefly quote from page 32 of the government's brief when it states, Odom's opinion was helpful to the jury's understanding of disputed factual issue of whether appellant beat her child. Appellant agrees that this was opinion and testimony. Appellant agrees that it influenced the jury. But appellant disagrees that the opinion was properly admitted over objection, especially since it was presented as expert opinion. Mr. Engel, with respect to that issue, what, uh, what objection are you referring to? Um, my review of the record does not appear to, to indicate any objection was raised at the time this testimony was offered. The, and and he, object, he granted the objection was belated. It came during redirect. And That's that, classic waiver, is it not? Well, there's, there's a case in this case, in this case that not only was there no objection raised on direct, but that he then pursued this line trying to challenge the, the witness's testimony on, on cross. And then it was not until the government's redirect that he raised any objection, which I think we have consistently held is classic waiver, is it not? Um, Judge Washington, let me, let me address that very specifically. Um, and I'm gonna address both the waiver and the open the door argument because I think they go hand in hand. And using the open the door metaphor, the door that was opened during the government's direct exam was a totally different door than was opened, than the government opened on redirect and went through. And our argument is somewhat convoluted here. So on, if I can have a minute, uh, I'll explain what I mean. It wasn't until redirect that the government changed the tenor of Odom's testimony by providing his credentials and experience with thousands of calls. On direct exam, Odom was just presented as a forensic investigator who extracted calls from Belcher's cell phone. And as one who extracted the calls, he was called as a witness to identify the calls and authenticate them to establish admissibility. And as part of that authentication process, and since some were difficult to hear, he was asked to indicate what was stated on the calls. The record is replete with the government asking him, what did you hear? And then um, Odom responding over and over again, what was on the recording? And at one point in responding to an objection during the Odom's direct testimony, the government explained the purpose of investigator Odom's testimony to the trial judge. And here I'm gonna quote from page 389 on November 1st. The prosecutor told the judge, and I'm gonna quote, I want to just authenticate these records through the investigator who downloaded them in the app. And also just to help translate what they are saying because it's a little bit fuzzy and unclear. Yet shortly after that explanation of the limited purpose of Odom's testimony, he was asked by the prosecutor to interpret the call. That's when he responded, being pretty bad discipline and that she was boasting or bragging. It's true that appellate didn't object at that point. And he did attempt to mitigate the damage by having Odom testify as to other things he actually heard, such as the constant vulgar language, the laughing, that, he had no, that Odom had no direct knowledge. But at this point, the jury was on the same footing as Odom. The government and the defense each had directed Odom to specific calls to highlight whether she was serious or not. And whether Odom thought that she was serious, or appellant was serious, had no more weight than the juries. It wasn't until redirect that the government upped the ante, now claiming that Odom had expertise in interpreting calls. On redirect, Odom indicated that he was not just his personal impression, but rather he was in a better position to evaluate than the jury. He gave the jury reason to trust his assessment over their own. Quote, and as an examiner and an agent, I've listened to thousands of calls over my career, and I can discern when someone is more serious about taking an action versus someone who's not concerned or they're joking. Mr. Mr. Engel, why isn't, that a, why isn't that appropriate redirect when on cross-examination, he was actually challenged on his um, evaluation during direct of whether they was joking or serious or why he took it seriously as opposed to took it as a joke? 
for one thing, his opinion of whether she was serious or not is immaterial. It's irrelevant. That's up for the jury to decide. And most well, wait, a minute, wait, a minute, wait a minute. I'm sorry, Mr. Engel. Irrelevant is not the issue here. Whether it's irrelevant is not the objection. There was no objection to relevancy. The issue was is, in this particular case, after that cross went further than he had done on direct, why his redirect that seems to be addressing why he considered this call to be serious and not a joke, why isn't that an appropriate um, redirect examination? And your argument to me is, well, it seemed to be transforming it from a lay opinion, which you're not objecting to if that's what he gave on direct, to an expert opinion. Is that your argument that in fact, because that was his objection. His objection on redirect was, this is now expert testimony and the trial court uh, dismissed that. So is that your argument that, that somehow it went from lay to opinion testimony, which was admissible to expert opinion testimony, which was inadmissible on redirect? Well, actually uh, I can get to lay opinion testimony, but yes, that's basically the substance of our argument is that that changed the tenor of his what he had testified to before. And now he was establishing himself as an expert witness and that related back to his earlier opinions. So even if they were acceptable lay opinions, which we don't concede, and I can talk about that if your honor wishes, um, they transformed them to an expert opinion, which was not admissible. All right, well, you can go back. You please go back and talk about why this is not a, an admissible lay opinion. I would be glad to do that. The, first of all, the government did not argue that this was a lay opinion below and should be precluded from advancing that new theory on appeal. On appeal. Had the government raised it below, appellant was entitled to voir dire the witness on his- I'm sorry, Mr. Engel. They, they didn't have to offer it as, there was no objection to it. It was, it was opinion, it was testimony was offered. Why, why are we shifting the burden back now to the government to have somehow cured or addressed an issue which they didn't believe was an issue at the time? Uh, and how do we review that for trial court error? The government's only way they tried to validate what went on is through uh, the open the door argument. They did not below, they never put the defense on notice that an opinion was coming. They never did anything like that. And they didn't argue this was an opinion below. This is a new found theory that comes only on appeal. And you can't expect defense counsel to read the mind of the government and to know what they're going to be doing and to know their theories. No, but Mr. But Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Engel, I'm going to let you go on because we don't want to take up too much time. But so if I understand your argument correctly, when this testimony was offered on direct, when they asked him a question, they had an obligation to to first inform defense counsel he was about to issue a, a, a lay opinion and then somehow set a foundation for it, which I'm not aware of what that foundation might be under 701 that you think he had to let and then give the defense an opportunity to challenge it all before they could offer this evidence to the jury? This was never presented below as lay opinion. So the, the trial judge never passed on whether or not this was, uh, and never exercised her discretion on whether or not this constituted lay, uh, lay opinion. Had the government made that argument below, appellant could have raised issues below and, and voir dared the witness at that point regarding why this isn't acceptable lay opinion. But I don't think that they can do it for the, it's our argument that they cannot do that uh, for the first time on appeal. Okay. And, and frankly, we would suggest that had this been raised below as lay opinion, it was not acceptable lay opinion. Um, he, while Odom was addressing an issue that the jury needed to determine, it wasn't helpful to them to know his opinion of it. He testified he'd never met appellant. He was in no better position to assess her seriousness or not than the jury was. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that when we've, the jury, I understand, heard the tape? The jury was perfectly capable of listening to it and forming their own opinions. Why doesn't that make this issue harmless? This, that you're making? Exactly, because on cross, on redirect, the government now present, lifts him up as an expert. And now the jury is now, is not, they're not on the same footing as Odom anymore. They are now, he is now above them and he is giving an opinion based on his experience and training. 
And so the jury can rely on that and perhaps did. And so that's- Or the jury could have rejected it based on their own experience with listening to the tape, correct? We instruct them that they do not have to accept a, 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 an expert's opinion. And it's, I assume that was done in this case. It's, I would actually have to go back and look. Um, but you know, I think that my, our point is that appellant was entitled to have that jury make that assessment without, without Odom's thumb on the scale. I understand, I understand. Uh, okay. With that, we'll Mr. Engel, I assume you want to leave a few minutes yes. for rebuttal. That's the, when let I us, said let us, hear from, let us hear from the government. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nello, you're, uh, you're on mute. There you go. Can you go. May it please the court, Elizabeth Danella for the United States. The trial court did not abuse its discretion in admitting the redirect testimony of Investigator Odom. As to the direct testimony, as Judge Washington has suggested, this is a classic case of waiver. Appellant did not object during the direct examination or any time after, and instead he chose to develop it on cross-examination. Uh, as this court has uh, noted in Sobin, having adopted that strategy, appellant cannot complain if it backfired. So the only issue properly before the court is the redirect testimony. And there, as the trial court found, appellant had opened the door and this was a proper response to the cross-examination. Now on cross, appellant chose to elicit from Odom testimony that would help the defense try and rebut the inference from the call that appellant had done something harmful to her child. And to that end, she elicited helpful testimony, helpful points. She established from Odom that the um, appellant and her cousin regularly use this kind of vulgar language, that the phrase fucking somebody up can be done in a lighthearted fashion as indeed it was in the belt call and that the bouncer seat call um, was simply a general conversational call and there was a jovial tone to it. Now, to be sure, Odom did testify uh, in the course of cross-examination that he took this call seriously because it was a child, but that was it. He was not allowed to explain why that mattered. And so on redirect, the government was entitled to complete the story to have Odom explain how, based on his experience, um, based as a criminal investigator, interviewing people, listening to calls, listening to calls in this case, that the phrase fucking up a child is highly unusual. You don't hear that. And also to allow Odom to explain how the tone of the call was something that the jury could key in on. On cross-examination, appellant focused, for example, with respect to Belt's conversation with Belcher, with Bra uh, Bratcher, um, that there's laughter in the call. Well, on cross exam, on redirect examination, the government was entitled to follow up on that, and for Odom to explain that yes, there was laughter in that call, and you listen to Bratcher's voice, there's no sense of fear or intimidation. But in contrast, when Appellant is talking about having fucked up her child, there you can hear stress. She repeats it. The tone of it is boastful. And although the jury, yes, could listen to these calls, the point is, is that um, these calls, as the trial court pointed out, are hard to listen to. There's a lot of slurring, mumbling, slang. It's hard really to decipher what's saying. You will have to listen hard just to figure out what these people are saying. And in doing so, one can miss the nuance. And that's what um, Odom's testimony was helpful in providing. Ms. Danello, um, yes. Mr. Engel is arguing that so that, that that testimony, because it also um, was based on his experience as a police officer or criminal investigator, was transformed from the lay opinion testimony, which he still objects to, and I know for the record, uh, on direct, into some sort of expert testimony for which there was a, no foundation laid. Um, and that was the objection of defense counsel at trial, that there was no foundation laid for this now expert opinion testimony. Um, why, why, wasn't, uh, why isn't that argument um, one we should take seriously? 
because this simply was not expert testimony. His opinion was not based on any specialized technical knowledge, but rather he used reasoning familiar to the average person in everyday life. Uh, he, and he explained his reasoning to the jury. Listen to how these people are talking. Um, in my experience, I have not heard um, women talk about children in this way. There's nothing specialized about that. This is classic lay opinion testimony. Did, did the jury uh, learn that um, uh, the, the investigator had, had actually um, listened to other calls involving comments about children? And what, what, was, what, if anything, was said uh, by way of explanation of his particular background and experience as, as an investigator? Um, his experience is addressed at pages 460 and 461 of the November 1st transcript. And he talks generally um, about his experience. Having grown up in this area, he's a 46, or was at the time of trial in 2017, a 46-year-old black man. Uh, his job is to investigate violent crimes. He interviews people um, of all walks of life. He listens to calls. And what he says is that you don't hear women talking about children fucking up a child in that magnitude. And later he says on page 461, you don't hear that. So um, that is uh, the testimony he gives in terms of his foundation, uh, in terms of his experience. And it's appropriate to provide lay opinion testimony based on that experience. Right. There, there was no explicit statement that I've listened to many, many calls involving people talking about children and I've never heard this. It, it was no, just, I've, I've listened to many calls and I've not heard this. Well, it, his testimony was, I haven't heard, um, he was talking about the phrase, fucking up, fucking up a person. And he was saying, I have not heard that in reference to children, um, which is, as he explained on, or started to explain on cross-examination, why he took this call seriously. And the redirect um, was a chance for him to flesh that out, complete the story, explain why it was that that was significant. Um, Can I, Ms. Dinello, um, we, we didn't raise with, um, I did not, the panel did not raise with Mr. Engel the issue of sufficiency, but I am concerned and would like to hear your response to uh, his argument on sufficiency on count one. And then I want a quick question on, on the sufficiency on count three, but but only as far as the concession that appears to have been made by the government that, that really the only issue there is the failure to uh, seek medical attention. So on count one, there seems to, the, the argument is the evidence is insufficient because there's just no evidence that ties the, the, the June 18th event to the bouncer seat event to my client and, that was, and, and the injuries that the child suffered. Um, why isn't that uh, uh, the, the, a, a winning argument with respect to the sufficiency of the evidence in count one? There was powerful evidence of guilt with respect to count one. And this also ties into any error with respect to the Odom testimony being harmless. Uh, the specific evidence on which the jury could rely was one, the autopsy evidence which showed that in addition to the immediate injuries that XL suffered, there were older injuries, specifically to his right kidney and his lung, where there were macrophages. And by the way, I apologize, in the brief I typed it as microphages, it's actually macrophages. Um, there were macrophages indicating that those injuries were sustained um, approximately five or more days before. Uh, macrophages generally appear after five days, um, sometimes, sometimes later, very rarely sooner. Um, so we know that somebody beat that child fairly, pretty severely, um, at least five days before, uh, before his death. Um, beat him in the chest and the back probably because of the kidney injury. And the force was consistent with punching or kicking. We also know from uh, Belt, the boyfriend, that appellant had admitted to him that sometime in June, she had fucked XL up for having uh, tipped over the bouncer seat. And that's consistent, of course, with her statements in the so-called bouncer seat call 
when she said that she had um, fucked him up after he had uh, knocked over his sis the baby sister's seat. Um, the timing of the call, appellant at page 28 uh, in his brief concedes that the call was five days before the murder. But even apart from that, um, even apart from that, the fact is that she's made that omission and there is other um, quite compelling evidence that she was the one who had engaged in the long-term pattern of abuse of this child. Uh, given that, for example, Belt testified that he had previously seen her punch the child in the chest. Um, well, that's consistent with the type of injury that would have caused what the, was found in the autopsy. Um, we have the testimony of the sister that he complained of a painful bruise in the back. Well, that's consistent with the type of injury that was found in the autopsy. And then, of course, we have the testimony of Siobhan Streeter, the neighbor on the night of June 23rd, overhearing the horrific beating. That well, I'm, I'm, and I'm separating, actually, Ms. Donnell, I'm actually separating count one, right, which is a different date and time than the rest of the events that... But, that but, in, looking at, but in looking at who would have the injuries, the older injuries um, that were evident in the macrophages uh, apparent during the autopsy, the jury properly could consider the fact that um, she committed the later offense as well. Um, so does that answer your question with respect to count one? It does. And, and to count three, um, you were asking about our concession that um, the jury properly could rely on the failure to seek medical attention. And that is what we rely on now on appeal. Okay. Do you have any further questions about that? No, I don't, I'm fine. Does the court have any further questions? No, I think we don't. So we'll let you. Thank you. And we'd, we'd ask oh, the court you. to affirm the judgment of the Superior Court. Great, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Engel, a few minutes in rebuttal. Uh, just re with respect to that last point, um, as the government concedes, what the evidence showed is at least five days, five days or more. Uh, I wrote that down uh, while Mr. Nello was speaking. Um, that's just insufficient to link what she said five days earlier to these horrific injuries. I mean, you just can't say that that is enough to demonstrate that an old injury was inflicted by her based on that call. And with that, we'll submit. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Council, thank you both. The case is now submitted. Okay, this honorable court is now back in session. Good morning. We're ready to hear argument in the third case on the calendar this morning, Milton Ward versus United States. Counsel, Mr. Gannan. Uh, good morning, your honors. Uh, may it please the court, Daniel Gannan on behalf of the appellant Milton Ward. I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Mr. Ward's unconstitutional UF conviction should be vacated under one of two procedural avenues, either one of which is sufficient to resolve the case. First is what I'll call the class claim. That claim is that under the Men of Blackledge doctrine, the guilty plea does not bar Mr. Ward from directly challenging his conviction under the Second Amendment. The second avenue is what I'll call the Magnus claim. That claim is that Mr. Ward's plea was not knowing and intelligent because it was premised on a mistaken understanding of the scope of the Second Amendment. For the class claim, the government raises two procedural objections. First, that class is limited to federal direct appeals, and second, that class announced a new rule of law that does not apply in this case. So to start with the, the first issue, whether class is limited to federal direct appeals, the, the reasoning of class and its doctrinal basis does not support that conclusion. Uh, the Mena Blackledge doctrine itself is named for a state direct appeal and a federal habeas review of a state conviction. Um, and what class's reasoning is based on is the kinds of constitutional claims that are or are not waived by a guilty plea. So it's not about- Mr. Mr. Gunan, could you help me understand in your view why the Supreme Court repeated time after time after time in class that it was referring to a direct appeal? Sure. So there, the reason that was at issue is because the government actually conceded that class could potentially raise his constitutional claim collaterally, but they said he couldn't do it in direct appeal. And uh, I, I, part three of the court's opinion in class, that's the part that is 
they've, they've already said in part two, you know, this constitutional claim is not waived by the guilty plea. But in part three, they say, let's respond to specific points raised by the government and in the dissent. And look at what those um, specific points are. You can see the government was saying, even if you didn't waive your second amendment claim, you actually waived your direct appeal as a procedural vehicle to assert that claim. So for example, they said during his plea colloquy that he had waived his direct appeal and the court said, no, we don't buy that because it wasn't, it, that waiver was not in the plea agreement. And then but the government- Let me interrupt you for a second. Mr. Class did in fact bring a direct appeal. And so far as the opinion reveals, it was a timely direct appeal. Uh, your client uh, showed up four years after his uh, guilty plea and that has to make a difference, doesn't it? Uh, it, I mean, it could make a difference if the government had argued that there was some kind of procedural bar and then we would have gotten into that whole issue. But our, our jury has a different rule than the federal rule. Uh, Mr. Ward could not have filed a direct appeal from his guilty plea to raise this claim. Or to put it another way, if he had filed that appeal, it would have been dismissed under Lorimer and Wallace. The government doesn't dispute that. So the vehicle that he was the vehicle he was supposed to use in this jurisdiction is to move, move to withdraw his guilty plea, and that's what he did. Uh, the government hasn't argued it's untimely. They haven't argued that they've been prejudiced by the delay. So the-, the Mr. Gannett? Yes. I'm sorry, I thought you were stopping there. I don't mean to <laughs> cut in, but assuming uh, that um, Mr. Gannett, Mr. Uh, Ward's Second Amendment claim is not waived, uh, under class, uh, and um, assuming that we treat this as equivalent to a direct appeal for that purpose. Um, must Mr. Do you agree that Mr. Ward must show plain error in order to prevail on his Second Amendment claim, given that he did not raise the claim uh, prior to his uh, sentencing? No, I don't think he has to show plain error and, and certainly the government hasn't even hinted at that sort of argument. Uh, so it, it's well, been it waived. Seems to me, how do you, do, it seems to me, there is case law that would suggest that he does have to show plain error. And um, it seems to me if we reason this way, suppose he had gone to trial and not raised um, the second amendment claim. I think we'd all agree that he would have to show plain error on appeal. He might be able to, but he'd have to show it. Plain error, this is a forfeiture rather than a waiver. Um, if that's true, if he had to go to trial, why wouldn't it also be true if he failed to raise the claim before he was convicted by way of a guilty plea? Well, plain error is, is, is a, a rule about that's limited to appeals uh, and I think in collateral claims, you have a whole different set of procedural hurdles that would potentially well, that's have to That's true, I'm giving overcome. him the benefit. My question posits that he gets the benefit of our treating this, uh, or his appeal in this case. Uh, his, his, well, it, it, it assumes that we're giving him the benefit of our treating all his post-conviction uh, uh, litigation as equivalent to a direct appeal because he could not have raised the claim on direct appeal. So, okay, but unlike Mr. Class, for example, who did raise the claim before he pled guilty, um, Mr. Ward didn't. So it seems that's why I'm asking you whether um, uh, if we say, okay, it's not waived, we nonetheless treat it as unpreserved and therefore subject to the restrictions of plain error review. I don't think so. You know, Lorimer, which is the, the case, the kind of prime case that holds, you can't do a direct appeal from a guilty plea. One of the things they say is we want these claims to be brought collaterally because often you're gonna be um, expanding the record and um, bringing out new facts. That's true, it's just like an ineffective sentence claim, you say, but, but the, um, I mean, the, what Lorimer is, is thinking about in a way mm -hmm. are your standard um, motion to withdraw a guilty plea uh, 
not based on a pure legal issue, like this one is, or a pure legal claim, but based upon claims that are not necessarily already in the record. And so, but even there, a different standard or a tougher standard applies to the motion to withdraw that's not filed before sentencing, but only filed after the conviction is final. Um, there is case law uh, suggesting that it, that plain error applies. But let me ask you a related question, regardless in a way of what standard of review we apply. Are you asking um, this division of the court to do something that we really are um, precluded from doing under MAPB Ryan? Um, because prior decisions of uh, other panels of this court have already dealt with the Second Amendment claim you're raising here. And um, we don't have any controlling or supervening uh, decision from the Supreme Court um, uh, overruling those decisions. Aren't, we, aren't our hands tied? Even if we were to say, well, gee, on a clean slate, we might agree with you. Don't you have to really bring this case to the en banc court? to prevail? I don't think so for, for a few reasons. Uh, you know, I'm certainly aware that in the past, this court has said it's not clear or obvious that Heller requires the application of the Second Amendment outside the home. Our position is we're not in a plain error situation. The government hasn't argued that. Um, uh, the second reason I don't the think- The fact that the government hasn't argued it, I don't think the issue doesn't come up unless they, unless it turns out you're not waived and you're able to proceed, and then they could argue it down the road. Um, I, I don't see that the fact, I don't see that the government has waived the, waived the forfeiture, <laughs> uh, especially when they're not waiving the waiver. Um, well, so I mean, I, they didn't. I don't think that really makes a difference to us. Well, it, it would have, the time to raise plain error would have been in their supplemental brief uh, no, or in their really original brief. But, well, they could have. But I mean, you know, have. even if we don't um, use the phrase "plain error," uh, it seems to me that the test that has to be met under Magnus is like the first prong of the plain error test. Um, wouldn't you agree? Uh, to to show uh, that an error is plain is kind of equivalent to to showing that it's been uh, clearly established by case law that he um, had a Second Amendment right that covered uh, his conduct. So. Uh, it seems to me you you you're back in the same position, and and you still need to deal with Judge Glickman's question about MAPB Ryan. Okay, so it, for the Magnus claim, I don't agree that we have to show uh, clear error. You know, Magnus set, talks about being under a mistaken um, mistaken assumption. It doesn't say a clearly mistaken assumption. But I think a, a better argument for us is actually from from um, Bowsley, the case that Magnus relies on. Um, and this issue came up in sort of a different way, but what the Supreme Court ended up saying is that Boosley argued he couldn't challenge his plea until Bailey had come out. Bailey is kind of the case that established the substance of his claim. And before Bailey had came out, his local circuit president was contrary to Bailey. So he said, how could I have brought this claim until Bailey came out and what the Supreme Court said is you could have brought this claim even before Bailey came out. The claim was available to you. You could have brought it on direct appeal uh, as required in the federal system. Uh, there were other cases that had applied the law at issue in the way that Bailey ended up endorsing. Uh, and that's certainly the situation we have here where we have you know, a unanimous body of federal circuit law that has either expressly held the Second Amendment applies outside the home or uh, sustain, you know, assumed it does and, and sustained regulations under intermediate scrutiny. But none of the federal circuits have held, uh, ha have endorsed the argument that the Second Amendment is, is limited to the home. Uh, that argument is unsupportable from the, the text of the Second Amendment or the, the historical sources that Heller relied on. Mr. Bonan, yes. Mr. Bonan, if you excuse me, I'm still not hearing an answer to Judge Glickman's question which is, isn't, a, isn't this panel of the court bound by our prior case law under MAP versus Ryan? You may have a decent argument that those decisions are wrong, but we're bound by them, aren't we? I don't think so. Uh, again, so 
I don't think plain error applies, but even if it does. Um, We're not talking about plain error. We're talking about MAP versus Ryan. No, if I understand. So if this case is not governed by the plain error standard, as I don't think it is, and the government hasn't argued, then this court has never reached the merits of the Second Amendment issue that we're raising. It's only said it's not clear or obvious from Heller and McDonald themselves that the Second Amendment applies outside the home. It's never said affirmatively held that it doesn't apply outside the home. And even TM, the government, the case the government cites from 2017, says, um, you know, we're just, we're all we're saying is it's not clear for purposes of plain error review. So the court has actually never held. I, I, I think you're not reading enough of our opinions, but let me ask you a different question. You want the benefit of us treating this as if it were a direct appeal. Suppose your client came to us 25 years after sentencing and said, hey, I just read this class decision. Um, I want to attack my guilty plea. Would we really be obliged to treat that as, the, as if it were a direct appeal? So I, I'm, I'm not arguing that the court has to treat this as if it were a direct appeal. Um, what I'm saying is that this is the procedural avenue that the court in prior decisions has said litigants should take to challenge a plea. Whether, you know, 25 years, I'm sure the government might have, you know, prejudice arguments or latches arguments, something like that, that might bar the claim in those circumstances. But they haven't raised any of kind of arguments, any, any of those kinds of arguments in this case. Um, and uh, just to as, go back. As you know, uh, one can move in the Superior Court, one can move prior to sentencing to withdraw a plea, but you can also move after sentencing. Perhaps we should treat differently motions to withdraw that are filed and denied prior to sentencing. An appeal from that would be essentially on the same timetable as a direct appeal. But why aren't we allowed to treat differently motions to withdraw that are filed, say, four years after the sentencing and uh, are not on the same timetable? There's a significant delay. Right. So what this court has said about delay is that uh, delay matters when the government asserts that it's been prejudiced by the delay. Um, so uh, that's from Gooding. Uh, where there has been a delay, regard talking about delay in filing a motion to withdraw, where there has been a delay, regard may be had to whether the government would be prejudiced by withdrawal of the plea. And where such prejudice is absent or minimal, withdrawal is routinely permitted. Prejudice to the government's legitimate interest is measured as of the time at which the defendant seeks to withdraw the guilty plea, not later. That's from Gooding. Let me, let me, let me try it this way. Uh, there's a lot of case law, much of it discussed in Magnus that tries to appreciate the finality of a criminal conviction. And if a conviction has become final, then I understand your burden to be to come in with clear binding case law that shows that your conviction is unconstitutional. Uh, why shouldn't we treat this as a collateral attack rather than a direct appeal? Uh, I'm not saying don't treat it as a collateral attack. I, what I'm saying is that we, you know, in accordance with the precedence of this court, the mo a motion to withdraw a guilty plea or a writ of error quorum nobis were the sole and exclusive ways for Mr. Ward to raise these claims. He's now raised those claims through the uh, appropriate procedural vehicle. The government hasn't made an argument that it's prejudiced by any delay. Um, and we don't need to have a controlling precedent because the legal question is properly before the court. Was his I, here, I'm confused then because I read Magnus to say that you do have to have a controlling legal precedent. So why, why do you read Magnus differently? I think what Magnus says is where you have a controlling legal precedent, you can move to withdraw the claim, which was the situation in Magnus.
I don't read Magnus as saying that is the only way you can assert that your plea was unintelligent. And I read Boosley as saying the exact opposite, that you can challenge the intelligent nature of your plea, even when your substantive claim is contrary to local circuit binding precedent, which is the situation that Boosley was in prior to Bailey. I am puzzled was, by, oh, I, sorry, Mr. Gannett, I did not mean to interrupt you, go ahead. No, that's fine, Your Honor, uh, please ask your question. Well, I'm a little puzzled by your willingness to say that we can treat this as a collateral attack rather than as a direct appeal. Because if we treat it, because, because if we don't treat it as a direct appeal or as equivalent to a direct appeal, then I think you run into the retroactivity issue created by uh, our adherence to Teague v. Lane. Um, I had thought that, the, that um, perhaps the way to look at this was to say, if we, if we treat this, let me step back and say, I think this, 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 this question is premised on the proposition that um, you disagree with, that uh, class created a new rule of criminal procedure. So mm -hmm. if we posit that, um, I, I had thought that the issue becomes in effect whether we are under Griffith v. Kentucky or cases that are still wending their way on direct appeal or under uh, Teague v. Lane, the cases that are on collateral challenge. And I thought your argument was, this is really like direct appeal. Our case was still before the Supreme Court uh, 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 insert uh, on a cert petition when the Supreme Court decided class. So we're out from under Teague, we're under Griffith. But that's intention with saying to us, you know, I'm not saying you should treat this like a direct appeal. It's a collateral attack. Okay. Well, I'm wondering if that makes a difference for, for, for our ability to, uh, for the applicability of class. Of course, you could say we could, we could apply class anyway, except we did have a different rule previously. Right. So I don't think it's retroactive application because, I mean, look at the court's MO, uh, MOJ in this case from 2017. It's, it applied Smith and said this claim is waived. And then the Supreme Court issues class, which essentially overrules Smith and sends the case back to this court and says, no, no, no. Um, Smith was wrong. This claim is not waived. So this court well, previously that doesn't tell us tell us whether we're under Teague or under or, or under Griffith. If I can if I can put it right, in that right. way, but it's not retroactive because we're not saying the pr the procedure at the trial or or in this case the plea changed something. Class didn't change anything about how you plead guilty. It changed the rule about the effect of a guilty plea in a later challenge, whether it's on direct appeal or whether it's raised collaterally. So the government came in and said, they didn't actually say it, but, but I assume they had said it, that, that the claim was waived. Um, okay, that, that was the law then, but while this appeal is still pending and goes to the Supreme Court, the law, so the Supreme Court changes, or you would say clarifies the Men of Backlash Doctrine and says uh, that this court's precedents had gotten it wrong. So now we're asking the court to apply in this case, in the same case that was decided in 2017, the correct rule of waiver as clarified by class. That's not retroactive application. We're not saying go back and the plea should have happened in a different way. We're saying the waiver in this very case under you know this case number in this court applied the waiver rule incorrectly based on class. So that's not a retroactive application at all. It's a rule about waiver um, that was applied in this appeal, and now the law has changed regarding the law of waiver in this appeal. So retroactive, to put it another way, if we were saying that a valid guilty plea requires the trial judge to advise the defendant that he may have a potential Second Amendment claim and affirmatively waive that claim, and if that doesn't happen, the plea is invalid, if that's what class had held, then yes, that would be a retroactive application because the, our argument would let be. Let me play you. with you on this then, because in effect, this court told Mr. Ward and the government at the time of the 
guilty plea that your guilty plea is a waiver of, uh, you know, any constitutional claim you want to bring under the Second Amendment <laughs> or whatever. So it's a waiver of any constitutional claim you want to bring. Um, the government relies on that presumptively when they agree to the plea. Mr. Ward presumptively knows that's the deal when he enters the plea. Now, that's a procedural rule, I think. It, it's a procedural rule that says you can't appeal this based on the reasons of the claim. If the rule subsequently changes after that is final, um, and Mr. Class then comes in and says, well, I realize the case is final, it was over with, and, and the rule was back then, I couldn't do this, but the rules changed and I'd like to do it. It does sound like that's a retroactive application of a new, posit that it's new, of a new procedural rule. I, I have a little trouble seeing why it isn't. Now, it's not a retroactive application if the case was still on direct appeal or, or, or the equivalent, even if he hadn't raised it up until that point. Um, I understand that. So newness might be an issue. Uh, and, um, and how we treat this as whether it's a direct appeal or a collateral challenge, fair issue. But, I, but, but if, if you lose on those two points, as it were, then I, I'm having trouble seeing why it's not a retroactive application of a new rule. Okay. So the, I think that, you know, the litigants sort of understanding of the procedural consequences of what they're doing during a guilty plea is not um, relevant to whether this is a new rule or whether it's a retroactive application or not. The government no. may have been mistaken about, they may have thought we don't need to, you know, we, you know, they actually, I think they have changed the way they word plea waivers after class, but they, they may have thought, okay, our plea waiver, we don't need to cover this. Uh, and maybe they were wrong about that, but their kind of understanding of the law doesn't mean we're asking for retroactive application of, of class. Um, you know, for example, to say, if to say class doesn't apply to Mr. Ward, the court would have to apply, say we're still gonna apply Smith, even though class has said Smith was objectively wrong. Uh, and I just don't see how this court could apply what the Supreme Court has said is the wrong rule in this appeal. The court would have to write an opinion saying Smith is still the law, at least in this case. And Smith is not the law in this case. Class is the law in this case because class speaks to this exact issue that we're arguing about, whether this constitutional claim has been waived by the guilty plea. Um, and I'm, I'm, I would like to address whether it is a new rule and whether Teague even applies to that question um, because this court six years before Teague had adopted a retroactivity rule in Fields and Fields says, if you apply settled precedent to new and different factual scenarios, it's not a new rule. And I don't see how you could read a, the, the class opinion and say, at least the Supreme Court saw itself as applying um, settled precedents in Mena and Blackledge to a, to a new and different factual scenario, which was a federal direct appeal, uh, in which there were specific arguments about federal rule 11A2, the conditional plea provision, and, uh, you know, um, an argument about what happened at the plea colloquy in class. So, uh, but the Supreme Court itself said our decision in class flows directly from Mena and Blackledge. And 150 years of precedent from state and federal courts, they certainly did not think this was a new rule. Um, and the, the, the Teague definition of what a new rule is, I don't think should apply in this court because it was it was expressly based on, you know, the comity and federalism concerns that apply to federal court habeas review of state courts. Uh, and, and that's not the situation we're in. So I don't think this court has to adopt that more narrow view of what a new rule is. And I think even under the Teague standard of, you know, apparent to all reasonable jurists, we satis class satisfies that because uh, as we say in our brief, you know, cases like Smith, which adopted a, a DC circuit decision were actually just premised on a, a objectively wrong reading of Meta and Blackledge as being limited to double jeopardy claims. Mr. Uh, Gonan, while yes. we're talking about a new rule, 
let me segue to new law. If I'm understanding this correctly, you cannot point to any decision binding on us that says your client's Second Amendment rights were violated. You are rather trying to use this as if it were a direct appeal to establish that law, that is to establish new law. Do I understand correctly? Well, I'm gonna qualify this by saying, I, you know, I would argue that based on putting aside the narrow holding of Heller, if you actually you know, review the reasoning and the legal steps it takes to reach its conclusion, it is clear that the Second Amendment applies to um, possessing a gun outside the home for self-defense. The government agrees that it's clear. They actually use well, the, the word question clear. Is how it applies. Well, it, I agree. And at a minimum, it has to apply um, to allow, it can't be a flat ban, um, which is the government agrees that, or do, at least they don't dispute that the UF statute as, was a complete ban on possession of guns for self-defense by non-residents at the time. It's not where, anymore. Where, where do you see that concession by the government? Uh, well, that's the position that they took. I'm sorry. So they don't... Um, they, the Solicitor General's brief that we cite, I, I understand them to be saying, you know, that is our position. We haven't misrepresented their position. In the New York case. Oh, sure. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Okay. But I've read that brief, and it goes on to say the question of carrying a loaded pistol outside the home is not presented in this case, meaning the New York case. So I'm not sure I read that as a concession that your client is right about the Second Amendment. Okay, so let's just take the government's concession that the Second Amendment applies to possessing a gun outside the home for lawful purposes. Uh, so you're saying, well, there's a, another step you need to take, which is that it has to also cover possessing a loaded gun. Um, so for that, I would say Heller is the answer, which, because Heller says, if you do have a right to possess a gun for self-defense, then a law that requires the gun is not uh, ready to use for self-defense is unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. So they struck down the, you know, the requirement that a gun... You're, you're always a very perceptive person, <laughs> but lots of courts around the country don't read Heller that way. They, they think that Heller leaves lots of unanswered questions, particularly about conduct occurring outside the home. So what I would say is, um, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that. Uh, you know, the, the seventh, the, the um, DC circuit and the, the ninth circuit, you know, we can put an asterisk on the ninth circuit because there's an en banc pending, but they have all expressly held that there's a right to possess a gun outside the home for self-defense. The cir Second Circuit has said, you know, it's not the core, but it ha the Second Amendment has to apply outside the home in Kachalski. And then the Fourth and Third Circuits um, have assumed that the Second Amendment applies outside the home and said it would be subject to intermediate, uh, a, re a restriction on gun possession outside the home is subject to intermediate scrutiny. So really the only battle, uh, and just even the dissenting judges in the Seventh Circuit and the DC Circuit um, you know, th that was their position that assume it applies outside the home, these regulations uh, satisfy intermediate scrutiny. So the battle in the federal circuits is really not about whether it applies outside the home or not. It's about whether outside the home is strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny. And that doesn't matter for this case because, because this case is about a flat ban on possession for non-residents and that would fail under any level of scrutiny. The government certainly doesn't defend, defend it as a reasonable restriction. Um, so, you know, that's been waived. So that, that really is where the battle lines have been drawn. No one is out there that I'm aware of seriously arguing at this point, based on a careful reading of Heller and the authorities it cites, that the Second Amendment is limited to the home, which is really, I think, just unsupportable from the text of the Second Amendment. It doesn't say there's a right to keep and bear arms in the home. Uh, and it's expressly linked to militia service. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, you know, it's not limited to militia service, but certainly that militia clause uh, 
uh, have to have some logical relationship to the right. So if you have a right to bear arms for militia services, that cannot logically be limited to the home. How and is then, there a right to, how is there an interest in self-defense that is affected by, or, or that is furthered by Mr. Ward carrying the gun in the glove compartment of his car loaded while he's driving? Self-defense can arise in a lot of different circumstances, but very, very rarely, I think, do people while they're driving their car um, get attacked and need to, you know, like the stagecoach driver who's, who's attacked by bandits, you know, fire, fire back at them while, while trying to get away. It seems like even if one could say that a person has a right to self-defense outside the home that justifies carrying a gun when the person is walking down the street, um, having it loaded it, while driving a car, um, maybe maybe this doesn't matter, but I, I do wonder about the, the validity of this claim. Well, I mean, the DC Council created a, a special crime of carjacking, uh, and in the legislative history, they talk about how cars are a sanctuary, and when a person is attacked in their car, it's especially dangerous, so they made it a seven-year mandatory minimum crime for unarmed carjacking, which is worse, so more serious than an and then an armed robbery of somebody walking down the street. So I think, you know, the council's view is that carjacking was, and to some extent, is a very serious problem that people in their cars, the car is almost like a, a second home. I think they even analogize it to the home in, in, the, in the committee report that enacted the carjacking statute. Um, so, and Mr. Ward talked in his motion about, you know, he used, uh, well, this might not have been the motion, but he talks about how when he was driving through DC, he was concerned about the crime rate. And look at what happened to him. He was in a, a minor fender bender. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. But imagine, you know, one of the people in that accident had a serious case of road rage uh, and he might have needed, needed to defend himself. Hmm. So I don't think you can okay. say that they're, okay. okay. <laughs> Let me, if, the, if you're subject to plain uh, error standard of review, this is looking ahead a little bit since we haven't, the question is not, I understand before us now. Do you think you could meet a plain error standard of review? Sure. That the, um, that, that the, that the second prong is uh, a plain error analysis is satisfied? I do think we can meet that. Um, so, you know, and again, I've acknowledged that the court has in years past said it's not plain, um, but that's partly based on sort of the way it was argued um, and partly based on the status of the law and plain error says you look at the law now. Now we have Wren, we have an unbroken line of cases. And I, uh, we do, I'm trying to find it in our reply brief. Um, but I did note that there, there are several federal circuits that have said, um, uh, you know, an error can be plain based on non-binding precedents from sister courts. So for example, uh, there was a case we cite in our reply brief that cited, um, you know, four federal circuit decisions that had all reached the same conclusion. They say that makes it plain um, under our law. I, th I think uh, there, there are other cases that have reached that conclusion. Um, and then even, you know, in the, um, the Michael Thomas case, I don't have the site, but, you know, that was a case where this court said we can recognize the plainness of an error by deciding the issue in this appeal. And we can we have discretion to do that when it's kind of an important recurring question, which this certainly is to some extent. To some extent, it's already been effectively decided by the DC Circuit. Um, for better or worse, the law in the District of Columbia is settled that people have a Second Amendment right to carry guns on the street, loaded guns on the street, and thousands of people are now um, licensed to do so. So to some extent, you know, it's already been decided, which I think kind of goes to the plainness of the error. And it would be almost unfair to, to treat Mr. Ward differently than a similarly situated non-resident now who does have a Second Amendment right to possess a gun and to, to have his conviction stand for conduct that has been declared unconstitutional um, is unfair to him. And the error is not subject to plain error review in our opinion. The government has, has waived that claim, but um, you know, we did kind of argue in our reply brief that we satisfy the plain error standard. And again, you know, I think in terms of what the error is, the government I don't think would dispute 
prong one or two of the plane or, or any of the prongs really, because they're, again, their position, and I, I'm acknowledging Judge Fisher's point, um, you know, but their position is there is a right to possess and transport a gun outside of the home for lawful purposes. Self-defense is a lawful purpose. And then the only thing that's missing is the, the loaded nature of the gun. For starters, you know, the fact that the gun is loaded is, is um, irrelevant under Jackson because Jackson says we look to the elements of the offense, not the broader conduct, and the elements of the offense do not turn on whether the gun was loaded. But even if you're going to take into account that the gun is loaded, um, Heller tells us that if you have that Second Amendment right, you know, the law can't force you to have the gun in a not ready to use situation. Um, so that loaded, part. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I was going to say, I think we're going over your a lot of time, and we'll give you a chance for. Um, rebuttal, of course. Let us hear from the government now. Mr. Goodham. Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the court, Goodham for the United States. I'd like to start, um, I, I heard my opponent mention waiver, forfeiture, concession on numerous occasions um, in addressing some of the substantive questions relating to the Second Amendment. Um, we, we did not address the merits of the Second Amendment claim because um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, this court in its order directed us to address uh, the impact of class um, on this appeal. Um, I feel like the government did um, its, its, its homework. It applied that, 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 that it's a very complex issue relating to class. Uh, we had 25 pages. More critically, our core point is that as we have articulated in our brief, we think that class does not excuse the defendant's waiver here emanating from the guilty plea. Um, that's our core point. Um, and we do believe that what is going on with the, the defendant's substantive Second Amendment claims is he's trying to ignore that hurdle and ask this court to, um, to create Second Amendment law on appeal. Um, and I think the best illustration of that is page 20 of the defendant's brief where he says, um, if this court now recognizes that the Second Amendment applies outside the home, his plea was not knowing. Well, the government's core point is relating to class and getting back to the question that was asked by this court, is we do not believe that class permits the defendant to raise these claims now. Class was confined to direct appeals and I wanna address my opponent's argument that class is not confined to direct appeals. We know class is confined to, to direct appeals for a couple of reasons. Number one, they said it twice in there when they twice articulated the holding. Um, number two, I would suggest it flows naturally from at least part of the reasoning behind class, which is that um, <clears throat> there is a direct appeal right articulated by the federal statute and um, that appeal right is not relinquished upon a guilty plea waiver, uh, upon a guilty plea. Um, Mr. Goodhand, <laughs> I've read class many times, but I don't remember seeing that opinion discuss the statute in the federal courts which gives a right to direct appeal. Um, if, I, if I may, Your Honor, I believe it is true that in the context of rebutting um, uh, some of the government's arguments, um, the court addressed the appeal issue and it said, um, um, with, with your, with, um, I'm sorry, I, 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 it, 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 it um, It, it, ah, here it is. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I apologize. Um, at 138S Court 805, um, I, I think it's fair to say that the court's reasoning depended at least in part on, quote, the statutory right to direct appeal. Um, and again, it is true that that was um, rebutting some of the government's arguments about waiver did emanate from the guilty plea. But again, I think that's partly, uh, partly uh, a, a foundation for the court's um, reasoning. Um, 
more critically, um, I think, you know, my opponent suggests that, well, class depends on Blackledge, class depends on MENA. And he then extrapolates from that and he says, well, um, Blackledge was in fact a habeas case. Um, well, I think we can assume that the Supreme Court understood the procedural nature of both Blackledge and MENA. MENA was a state case, Blackledge was a habeas case. And when they said in their holding, this is confined to direct appeals, they decided they wanted to confine the, 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 uh, the waiver, uh, um, the no waiver rule that they were articulating to direct appeals. And, and did the Supreme Court, excuse me, did the Supreme Court in class say that its holding was quote, confined, unquote, to direct appeals? Absolutely not. Um, but now, now he, I mean, I think there are two issues that you um, have to address if you're going to argue that it is confined to direct appeals. First, the Supreme Court said that class, whether, whether other people might agree with this or not, and obviously the, the, the Sunders did not, but the Supreme Court said that class was simply an application of the constitutional holdings. It's the only way I can describe it in uh, MENA and Blackledge. And those holdings clearly did not depend on the procedure by which the um, uh, defendant was challenging his uh, 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 guilty plea because Blackledge involved a collateral challenge. Um, second, um, as, as Appellant points out, in the District of Columbia, our case law has said that, um, in effect, a direct appeal is not the way in which you can challenge this, um, uh, in which you can, in which you can um, challenge a guilty plea, raise this challenge uh, after a conviction. Um, instead, you've got to follow the alternative procedure of a collateral challenge. And to my mind, there's a strong argument, tell me if you disagree, that that means that for, for, for these kinds of purposes, we have to treat that alternative method equivalently to a direct appeal. This comes up in, this, in the area of ineffective assistance, for example. Um, why is it we wouldn't do that here? So those are, those are the two hurdles I think you've got to overcome to persuade us that class is confined to direct appeals. Sure, I'll, I'll address the first part first. Um, again, I, I think we, we can assume that the court doesn't lightly articulate its holdings and use um, um, uh, stray words. Twice the, the court articulated a holding, twice it said direct appeal. And I would suggest that we, we can't put too much weight on Blackledge as my opponent does and its, its procedural posture because Blackledge was decided before um, a sea change, I would suggest, in the habeas jurisprudence in the federal system that emanated from the EDPA. Um, Blackledge, I'm sorry. Um, well, I, I want to stop you because whatever the federal change in the, in the, in the procedural system, it, did, it doesn't affect what states are allowed to do. Uh, so, so, that's true. I mean, if states have a more, and the district has as well, not adopted it, but, but put the district aside. Um, the, uh, the, the states don't have to follow EDPA. Blackledge no, still applies to them. I, if, the I rule understand. Black ledge, if the rule of Blackledge requires class, why does it apply to a state that doesn't have a direct appeal? Or the I, same I, EDPA stuff? No, well, I, I, I think my only point with that is that's, that's why, at, at least in the federal context, um, that's why class confined it to direct appeals. I 100% agree that, and I think this supports our point, that class is not controlling doctrine for this court. Um, that is, it, it was confined to federal defendants, it was confined to direct appeals. Um, and this court has its own statutory system relating to appellate rights. Um, and I think, um, for example, the, the case that we provided to you on Wednesday supports this, the suggestion that it is true if this court wants to go down the road of uh, agreeing with classes reasoning 
it is true that this court could could say, you know, we we also thought Blackledge meant one meant one thing. Now the court is telling us it means another thing. But um, the best evidence I would suggest that class is not controlling doctrine is that, for example, in Kansas there was a statutory rule that said guilty pleas waive all all constitutional claims. Of course, the district doesn't have that. But my point is, is that Kansas felt very free because of their different statutory system to ignore class and not con consider a controlling doctrine. Well, what it was ignoring, I think, um, was the proposition that the claim, the constitutional claim could be raised on direct appeal. It wasn't, I don't think, ignoring or disagreeing with the claim the, the holding of class that the, the guilty plea is not a waiver of the constitutional claim or, or do you think do you think I, and, and, and and therefore wasn't saying that that the claim could not be raised via a different procedure do you think I'm wrong I, about that no I don't think you're wrong about that I don't I, I, I think um, and that gets to your to your second point about why we can't treat this as an equivalent of a direct appeal um, I, 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 I don't think this can be treated as the equivalent of a direct appeal. Um, I understand um, direct appeals to emanate from, um, it, you know, this gets to finality. Um, a defendant who is convicted has 30 days to file a notice of appeal. He can then file a petition for cert. Once that period of time, it's a confined period of time. Once that confined period of time elapses, the courts treat the conviction as final. Um, and Do you understand that to be jurisdictional, that 30-day time deadline? I, 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 I don't think that's- Does a, that not matter? That it's I, not I don't think it matters because I do think what matters is the finality aspect. That is, we are comfortable with not treating a conviction as final for a limited period of time because you, um, it's, a, it's a limited period of time. This gets at the notion of why we don't let 25 years elapse and then you can attack a conviction. Suppose um, the defendant in this case, within 30 days after his um, guilty plea, had filed a direct appeal. It, it would have been, it would have been uh, dismissed pursuant to this court's case law in Lorimer and Smith. Um, and that, that I think gets me to my second point, which is, okay. So, um, so since the defendant knew that, but, well, all right, so, okay. And right. I, I mean, right. I understand that. So suppose the defendant, I really didn't put, frame the question properly for you. Suppose the defendant had filed a collateral challenge within 30 days after his direct appeal saying, I want to challenge the, um, uh, this uh, uh, conviction on Second Amendment grounds. I, I'm sorry, maybe I, I'm not following. Well, I mean, you're saying that you're saying that because he filed it more than 30 days after um, his, the time for filing a direct appeal run, ran, we should not treat his collateral challenge here as equivalent to a direct appeal. And I just want to follow this out and see whether you think that's true if he had filed his collateral challenge within 30 days after his conviction you would agree that we should treat it then as if it were as equivalent to a direct appeal. I, I guess I don't think it would be called a, it wouldn't be at that point a collateral challenge. That is, if, if, if he- A motion is, to withdraw his guilty plea following, following the sentence of, on a claim that he did not raise during the, um, uh, during the pen, during, uh, prior, prior to his conviction. Um, collateral attack on the conviction. So you're saying if he filed a motion to withdraw his guilty plea, it was denied within 30 days? On the 30th days. day after, you know, the, after the conviction, after he was sentenced and, and the judgment of conviction was issued. Um, I, well, I, I think that, that would be an appeal from a collateral, a denial of a collateral attack. That is, um, right. it, it was post-sentencing. Well, since I since he couldn't have taken a direct appeal from, right. uh, from his conviction, uh, should we treat that as the equivalent? of a direct appeal for class no, purposes? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think he gets the benefit of, um, uh, of an sort of, you know, all of the attendant 
features of a direct appeal when um, he, unless his court concludes that- Even though we said you can't take a direct appeal. It, well, this court would have, we would have asked the court to dismiss it and would have been dismissed um, for sure. And so that, that gets me to my second point, which is if, you know, and I think this is the, the retroactivity issue is there was, in, in, there was indeed an impediment that is a procedural impediment to the defendant filing a direct appeal after his uh, sentencing, um, that is, and his, and his conviction. Um, that is Smith and Lorimer. That was a procedural impediment. His appeal would have been dismissed. So what I understand the defendant to be asking this court now to do is say, okay, well, if, you, if this court adopts classes no waiver rule, then this court has to go back and treat my, um, uh, my initial inaction um, as excusable and give me the benefit of a direct appeal um, because Laura Mern Smith precluded me from pursuing that direct appeal after the denial of my of my uh, after my guilty plea. And that gets us, I think, into, well, that would be um, a, an articulation of a new procedural rule um, that, that does not apply on collateral appeal. Um, and so I think that, that then gets to the issue of whether or not this is Teague barred. Um, I, and on that note, I know um, my opponent has suggested, well, first he suggested Teague doesn't apply. I disagree with that. Second, he suggested that, well, if Teague doesn't apply, then Fields applies. Um, well, Fields simply asks the question whether this is um, the application of settled precedent. If this court concludes that Lorimer and Smith now need to be revisited because of class, then that is a reversal of Lorimer and Smith. And so it's not the application of settled precedent. It's, it's, the, it's by definition a new rule because you are overturning your otherwise extant ruling relating to a procedural bar. Um, so, I think I, I'm sorry. Mr. Goodhand, let me ask you to shift focus for a minute. Do you think this panel is free to rule in Mr. Gunan's favor on the Second Amendment issue? I do not, um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I, I, I don't think this court can be considered, you know, again, we don't believe class applies here. Um, and if class doesn't apply, then he's stuck with, um, um, he, he's- Forget about class, if you will. Let's assume we get to the merits of the Second Amendment. Are we free to rule in his favor? Under I, I do not, versus Ryan. I, I do not believe so. This court has repeatedly indicated that um, it has not decided the issue, the critical issue that is the lynch. Second, second question. Mr. Gunan said, as I understood him, that if we were to apply plain error review, the government would agree that the error was, that there was an error that was clear or obvious. Is that true? Absolutely not. Um, you know, again, we didn't address the merits of the Second Amendment claim. We were asked to consider class as impact. We did. The merits would be a whole different kettle of fish that I think would either require a remand to the trial court to consider if this court believes he hasn't waived his challenge um, on Second Amendment grounds, or at a minimum, a uh, briefing to this court. Um, I would suggest a remand to the trial court is the appropriate approach if this court decides that he does get a bite at the Second Amendment apple. Um, the defendant... Why a remand? Uh, why, why aren't we obliged to decide on the present record? And um, we would, the, the government would only have to establish that he is disqualified if there is a Second Amendment right to carry the, the gun outside the home. So what would a remand do? Well, I, I think a remand makes sense um, for a couple reasons. Um, number one, the, the defendant was proceeding pro se below. Um, he's now been appointed counsel. As I understand it, counsel would like to bring an as applied challenge 
um, to his uh, conviction on the second on Second Amendment grounds. Um, I, I, I think, in all candor, um, if he if this court believes that's an appropriate thing to do, then 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 they should be permitted to do it. Another thing I would note, um, just I want to make sure I don't sit down before I bring bring this to the court's attention, and it might be a little bit um, uh, a little bit to the side, but. Um, Judge Morin, um, when he denied um, the defendant's motion to withdraw his guilty plea, he articulated that he applied the manifest injustice standard. And he said, um, as one of the prongs, he said, um, the defendant has not raised a claim of legal innocence. Um, all due respect to Judge Warren, I, I think that the defendant did raise a claim of legal innocence. I think if you read his pleading, he's, he was actually fairly articulate. Um, in, a, in articulating that he did not believe that um, um, he was constitutionally um, uh, 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 convicted. Um, and um, in particular, uh, I would, um, I wanted, to, so my, my point, so it, it, my point is, is that um, this, if this court decides that he does get a bite at the Second Amendment apple, um, it, it probably makes sense for Judge Warren to consider whether or not um, that amounts to a manifest injustice in the context of a properly, um, uh, in, in the context of a, uh, an attorney argued um, 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 motion. Uh, the other thing let, I would note is that- we, Let me ask you for some help on that. Um, MAP versus Ryan. If we were to remand to Judge Morin, I suspect he would say, what do they want me to do? Maybe his claim of legal innocence was that the Second Amendment barred his conviction, but the Court of Appeals had told me that he doesn't have a Second Amendment right. So what am I supposed to do now? Um. Well, I think it could it could be very easy for the court to, uh, to resolve it. Um, I, I don't know the intricacies of his facial as applied challenge, and I certainly haven't given it much thought. Um, the The intersection of his claim about whether or not the Second Amendment applies outside the home, coupled with the DC registration scheme, um, is is very complex, and we haven't taken a position on that. Um, and that. Is I think the court would be would understand would require um, much discussion with, for example, um, Maine Department of Justice. Um, so we haven't taken a position on that. It could well be, depending on how he tees up his claim, it is true that Judge Morin could look at this court's decision in Debose, for example, um, and say Debose says we have not construed the Second Amendment to apply outside the home. That's the end of the discussion. Um, it could be that, that that's as easy as, as pie, if you will, for Judge Morin to decide. But I do think I would have been remiss if I didn't bring to the court's attention um, what I do think is a misunderstanding on Judge Morin's part when he was deciding the manifest and just standard in the context of the defendant's pro se pleading. I Mr. Agonin. Oh, sorry, go on. Go ahead, Mr. Gonan emphasized a couple of times that the government has never said that it was prejudiced by the timing of uh, the motion to withdraw the guilty plea. Um, uh, and I think that's right, but is it right? Is, is that a factor? Is, um, is that it a, is factor a factor this court should consider? It, it, well, it is a factor in the context of the manifest injustice standard, uh, definitely. Um, uh, the, the, the length of time uh, between the articulation of um, your decision to, to withdraw um, or ask for withdrawal and when you actually file that um, post-sentencing. Um, and we did bring that to the court's attention in our opposition to his motion to withdraw. So I, I, I think that's definitely an articulation of what we consider to be prejudice. Um, we, we did bring that to the court's attention. All right, so Mr. <laughs> Mr. Um, uh, Good hand. I'm not sure I understand where the government comes out on certain issues here. Um, I, I read I read class as saying that 
um, a guilty plea is not a waiver of the constitutional claim. Questions about the procedure under which the unwaived claim can be pursued and what hurdles will have to be overcome are secondary questions. But I do read class as saying it's not a waiver. So end of story on that. Now, and that's a constitutional holding, not a statutory holding, because it's based on MENA and um, uh, the other case. <laughs> Blackledge. Um, Blackledge, right. Um, so I, I think the question does come down to, under our prior case law, are, are this panel's hands tied um, by MAP v. Ryan, by MAP v. Ryan? Now, I understand Mr. Ganen's argument to be that no, our prior cases did not quite tie our hands. They were cases in which for one reason or another, Mr. Ganen will correct me if I misunderstood his position. They, they uh, when he gets up on rebuttal, they were cases in which for one reason or another, this court simply found that it was not required to and did not feel like reaching the question, of the ultimate question of this, whether the Second Amendment applies, um, as he suggests, outside the home. Now, what's your answer to that? Does MAP v. Ryan preclude us as a panel from holding, for example, that the Second Amendment uh, provides a constitutional right to possess a uh, gun, a loaded gun, if you want, outside the home um, for purposes of self-defense, and therefore, Mr. Uh, and, there, and, and that claim has not been waived, and therefore, uh, Mr. Ward uh, may be free to pursue it, subject to whatever, you know, curl and cue restrictions we want to throw on that. Or does, or does MAP v. Ryan preclude this court from saying that or not? It does. Um, Tell me why. It, it, as I understand this court's prior rulings, um, it, it, this court has said, we have not, we have not said that the Second Amendment applies outside the home. Um, okay, we haven't said it. Why can't we say it now? Well, ag again, because- As a panel. Uh, well, because we don't think that the, this, this um, he has, gets the benefit of a direct appeal. Um, and that's, that's, of our, that's our core argument here, is he, 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 he can't attack the constitutionality of his conviction via a direct appeal. Um, that's not, I'm, I'm asking you an MAP v. Ryan question. I'm not asking you whether there are other reasons why his, his um, argument falters. You're, you're, you're telling me what class doesn't apply, it's not retroactive, it's, I, I got all that. But I wanna know the MAP v. Ryan question. If, the answer to the MAP v. Ryan question. I, I, I don't, I, I, if, if, you, if you assume away all of, of our, our other arguments, then I, I'm not sure I, I disagree with the notion that um, if, if, and again, I'm, I apologize, I'm not entirely conversant on this court's uh, myriad cases on, on the Second Amendment because we did not brief that. We didn't think it was appropriate to brief that, um, and we didn't think we were asked to brief that. Um, with those caveats, I, I don't, I don't, understand this court to have definitively ruled that the Second Amendment doesn't apply outside um, the home. And so in that respect, um, putting aside the, the myriad caveats I've just articulated, uh, I, I'm not sure I, I disagree with the notion that MAP would not preclude it. Um, but again- well, Let me go back, Mr. Goodhan, to a point you made recently about how Judge Moran may have misconstrued uh, Mr. Ward's motion when Judge Moran said he did not raise a claim of legal innocence. Are you suggesting that if that question had been presented in Mr. Ward's prior appeal, we should have vacated the ruling and sent it back because Judge Moran failed to rule upon a key legal issue that had been raised by Mr. Ward? I, no, I don't. I don't think I, the, the discretion is an abuse of discretion standard um, when you are applying the manifest injustice standard, um, and it's a multi-pronged test. Um, it depends on 
a claim of legal innocence, it depends on the delay and it depends on whether or not there was competent counsel. Um, I think um, it, it, it's, it would not necessarily be an abuse of discretion, um, even if you considered Judge Moran to have overlooked his claim of legal innocence for Judge Moran to have relied on both the fact that he had competent counsel, there was not a defect in the plea colloquy, and he sat on his rights for four years. <clears throat> now, why should we not, so far we've been focusing on what we might call the class issue. Well, even if he does, as Mr. Ganem mentioned at the start of his oral argument, um, even if he does not prevail on the, what we call the class argument, he's also got what he's called his Magnus argument. Um, why shouldn't we um, remand for a hearing on whether this, was, this plea was knowing and voluntary? Well, um, it, it, that, that remand, I would suggest it's not necessary. Uh, Magnus says, where a subsequent court ruling makes clear that the defendant's charged conduct was constitutionally protected and couldn't have been criminalized, a collateral challenge is not foreclosed. Um, we, we, as we've articulated, show that he has not demonstrated there is a subsequent decision making clear that he, is, that he engaged in constitutionally protected um, uh, um, uh, conduct. And that, that gets back to DuBose and the, the decisions that say, if nothing else, we haven't ruled one way or the other on the Second Amendment. Well, I read Magnus to stand for the proposition that the defendant, if he's going to suggest my plea was not knowing, at a minimum, he has to show a definitive court ruling saying that his conduct was constitutionally protected. Um, and he, I read Magnus. Suppose he, suppose he says, look, what I didn't know is that there was a substantial argument that it was constitutionally protected. Yeah, I don't think that's nobody, nobody explained to me that Heller left this, that, that Heller has really changed the whole um, uh, way of looking at these questions. And in my calculus about whether to plead guilty or not, I should have been advised that I might well have a valid constitutional defense here. And I should have been told that and been able to evaluate whether that affected my desire to plead guilty. Yeah, th 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 that doesn't suffice, I think, pursuant to the Magnus standard. Um, again, this gets at the core issue of finality. We're talking about the extraordinary quorum writ. Um, and if you were going to suggest that this- court... Suppose it had been a claim of self-defense. Suppose he had said, look, I had a valid claim of self-defense. Now, I understand the, the evidence was sort of against me, but I did have some evidence in favor of self-defense. It could have gone either way, who knows? But nobody advised me about that claim of self-defense. Would that be a knowing and voluntary plea? Um, I, I think that, that, that would get at the, the competence of his counsel. Um, and um, I think he could raise that on a collateral attack but I, I don't think that answers the question that Magnus, the, 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 narrow, the narrow holding of Magnus that permits um, a, the possibility of um, innocent, basically you're saying I was innocent um, pursuant to subsequent decisions from the uh, governing court. And that, that just hasn't appeared either in this court's case law or certainly not in the, in the Supreme Court. Um, okay, I think we've heard, I think we've gotten your argument. Um, let us hear from Mr. Uh, Ganan in rebuttal. Mr. Ganan, we're going to give you just a few minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'll just start with the Second Amendment. I think it's fair to characterize this court's cases as carefully avoiding the question of whether the Second Amendment applies outside the home or not. Um, and the government certainly hasn't cited any case. I haven't, I'm, I've, I think I've read all of them and I don't think there's any case that holds that doesn't apply outside the home. I'm aware there's a case that says you don't have a right to conceal to carry outside the home, but that's not an element of the offense at issue here. And actually there's a regulation 24, 2344.1 that says in a car, you have to conceal the gun. The regulation says, quote, when in a vehicle, uh, in, it has to be carried in such a way as it is entirely hidden from view of the public, um, which is 
not that important, but I, I don't think that the court has decided this issue. Um, and then I don't think it needs to decide this issue. I think that we, we've heard that we've gotten round, several rounds of briefing from the government. They say they didn't think they were supposed to address this in their supplemental brief. I mean, the, the court supplemental briefing order said the parties were not limited to the questions in the order. We made an offensive Second Amendment argument. And all they said is, yes, they've correctly characterized the position that the United States took um, in the New York State rifle case. They don't say that's not our position. I don't think they could say that. I mean, the Solicitor General speaks for the Department of Justice um, in litigation. Um, and even now they've, he, you know, I heard Mr. Goodhand say, essentially, I don't have a position on the Second Amendment. They have chosen deliberately to live or die on these procedural arguments. So I think if the court resolves the procedural arguments in Mr. Ward's favor, either of them, then it can just say the government has waived uh, this whole Second Amendment issue. Um, and the court certainly has the power to do that in, in cases like Rose um, and many other cases, the court has said where the government deliberately chooses not to brief an issue, uh, the, the issue will be deemed waived. Uh, I do want to address plain error. Um, again, the government didn't argue plain error. Um, I, I did uh, find a case, uh, the, uh, the court's on bank decision in Carroll um, that, that from 2017, this is 165 A third 314 note 30. Quote, we note that the government did not contend that Mr. Carroll's mens rea argument was unpreserved and subject to plain error in its briefing to the division. Uh, we thus conclude that the government waived its preservation challenge as to Mr. Carroll's sufficiency claim. Uh, so that's unquestionably happened here. They've never argued plain error. They didn't argue it in opposition to the motion withdraw. They didn't argue it in the initial round of briefing to this court, uh, and they haven't argued it in the supplemental briefing. So, yeah, the issue before us here was not what, what the standards of review would apply if you were right uh, and uh, entitled to um, raise the Second Amendment issue uh, uh, under class. So I, well, I don't... I, I, um, I, I mean, the government... I think has that's an open question. I, I think the government would have to raise that, and um, I don't would, see why they would. If we let you go forward, presumably, if if they if we let you go forward with a we'll call it a class pursuit, as it were, uh, they would then argue to the judge, okay, he didn't waive it. You're allowed to consider the argument. Now here's the, here's the uh, test under which you consider it. But that would be an alternative argument for them to have made in either their initial brief or their supplemental brief. They, and, you know, they, they said, they reached out and briefed this retroactivity issue that wasn't hinted at in the court's supplemental briefing order. They could have that said- That the question of whether class applied. Well, and they could have said, even if class applies, um, you know, we think the Second Amendment claim is subject to plain error. I, I don't think that they get seriatim, you know, chances to brief different issues as the court resolves one issue after the other. Generally, in litigation in this court, uh, you raise all your arguments in, you know, in your brief. You don't wait to raise different arguments uh, at different times, and that would be yeah, something. But when, that it, when it comes to this court articulating standards of law that are going to govern a whole range of cases from now on, it would be foolhardy for us to adopt a rule of considerable magnitude merely because as opposed to deciding just a particular case, merely because the government has not um, pressed an issue, particularly where it's a somewhat aside, aside from the main issue. That's my answer to that, I suppose. I don't know how you feel about that. Well, fair enough, Your Honor. You know, there are plenty of cases where this court has reversed convictions based on, um, you know, and implicit or expressed concessions by the government of constitutional issues. Uh, I, I do sort of want to maybe sum up by saying um, this is an issue of importance to Mr. Ward. And if he's not able to press his Second Amendment claim now, um, you know, the law is now settled in D.C. So the law, the statutes have been amended to fix the constitutional issue we've, uh, we've identified. The D.C. Circuit or the Federal District Court in D.C. has enjoined, permanently enjoined application of the laws in an unconstitutional manner. Uh, so 
I don't know that this court is going to have a lot of opportunities to address the Second Amendment issues on a blank slate in, in a future case. Um, but for people like Mr. Ward, it, it genuinely is unfair for him to be convicted of a statute that um, has been held unconstitutional by by the, the DC Circuit. Um, and he should have the opportunity to, to press that claim. Uh, one other thing I do want to add, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be done, um, is relates to the whole class issue. Uh, on page 57 of the oral argument in class, um, the government actually conceded that um, that uh, the constitutional claim in class could have been raised collaterally. Um, sorry, page 56 of the oral argument, which the government cites in its brief. Chief Justice Roberts says, he enters this plea agreement and the next day this court is a decision saying that, that statute is unconstitutional. You would still hold him to the plea agreement? And the Solicitor General uh, office said, well, Your Honor, he'd be able to get relief very easily under that circumstance, at the very least under 28 USC 2255 in a post-conviction motion, that being the, the federal uh, collateral motion statute. So the issue in class was whether to extend this to a direct appeal. And there were arguments the government had about why it didn't extend to direct appeal, but nobody disputed that you could attack the constitutionality of your conviction collaterally. Um, so unless the court has any further questions, we'd ask the court to reverse either reaching the Second Amendment claim or holding that the government has has waived it, which would not set precedent for future cases, but would at least allow Mr. Ward to resolve his case. Counsel, thank you both. Case is submitted. And you may both log out. <laughs> this, this honorable court is now adjourned.